For the next few weeks, I'm going to explore an extraordinary large-scale 18th century collection of paired preludes and fugues in all 12 major and minor keys twice over. Johann Sebastian Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier, published in two parts, the first in 1722 and the second 20 years later. The way these works are organized is via a slow chromatic climb, alternating at each stage between the brighter and darker modalities, with the first prelude and fugue in C major, the second in C minor, the third in C sharp major, the fourth in C sharp minor, and so on. In this video, I'll set the pattern I intend to follow, presenting the four movements based on tonic C the prelude and fugue in C major, and then those in C minor. I will follow the same pattern until we've made it all the way through both parts, 48 preludes and fugues in all. It should be a trip to remember. In these videos, I'll be using the Schirmer score, like the one that's probably occupying space in some bookcase in your house, as it is in mine and the splendid recordings by Tatiana Nikolaeva. I'll suggest at the outset that you prepare to ignore all the tempo and metronome markings, all the dynamics and interpretive gestures, and the fingerings as well, if that suits you. Those were all imposed on the original by various editors and may be safely dismissed. Within the strict overall pattern, Bach has taken a lot of different approaches in these movements, as is apparent in the first installment. Except for the closing bars, the C major prelude is based on a single arpeggiated gesture sequenced through all the chords that Bach visited, while the C minor prelude is a furious torrent of sixteenth notes in both hands, plowing through the harmonic changes like a ruthless machine until it reaches its golden section temporal division and the juggernaut gives way to an opulent cadenza which finishes the movement. You will continue to see much variety as we work our way through the set. After all, prelude is a temporal term, not a musical form. And the fugues are just as different. Fugue is no more a musical form than prelude, but rather a musical procedure, so there are all kinds of ways a composer can go with it. Hence the great difference between the unrelentingly polyphonic C major fugue with its real answers and ceaseless stretto compared to the much more homophonic sounding C minor fugue with its tonal answers. By the way, the golden section temporal division that I just mentioned, approximately 62% of the way through the movement, is often important and I'll occasionally call attention to it. Before I present the score and recording, I want to say something about the first prelude. As you probably know, Charles Gounod appropriated that prelude as a harmonic foundation for an Ave Maria setting, and in so doing, introduced not only an additional measure into the prelude, but I think a serious misconception as to what Bach was saying with his phrasing. With Gounod's additional measure, every phrase in the movement is four neat measures long, and that's pretty much the default phrasing for 18th century music, so it's exactly what we would expect. But that's not what Bach wrote, and it follows logically that there's a phrase elision somewhere in that prelude. That's not controversial. What is controversial is exactly where is that elision. There are several opinions on the market to choose from, and Ms. Nikolaeva has adroitly sidestepped the issue by imposing no phrasing at all on the main body of the movement, thus leaving you at liberty to construct your own. In my structural analysis, I've given you mine, which is a little different from most. Since I think it likely that most of my viewers will already have strong opinions about the phrasing of this movement, especially since all of our ears have been corrupted by the accursed Ave Maria, I feel I should forewarn you that my solution may take you by surprise and initially seem counterintuitive. 
but give it a hearing. Count your four measure phrases from the phrase beginnings I've indicated and see if the result doesn't make a lot of sense. We'll start making unexpected sense, I imagine, uh, by the time you're in the second phrase. Notice how neatly it takes care of what might otherwise seem a very clumsy progression.